enough for you to engage with our speakers. So please uh, feel free to ask questions and share your thoughts and comments. Um, in this case, Anupama is going to be giving a presentation, so I'm pretty sure she'll be happy to take questions at the end of it. Um, and I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce our next speaker and our next session. It is titled Rethinking Materiality, Investing in Human Resources to Reduce Natural, Natural Resources. And of course, we've got Anupama Kundu all the way from Berlin, who's going to be giving this talk. Um, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to Anupama. She's done in some incredible work over the years, so it's very hard to summarize it. But these are some certain things you must know about her. Uh, she graduated from the University of Mumbai in 1989, so she's a Bombay girl, and received her PhD uh, from TU Berlin in 2008. Her research-oriented practice started in 1990 in Oroville and has since been generating people-centric architecture based on spatial and material research for low environmental impact while being socio-economically beneficial. Anupama has taught architecture and urban management at various international universities, including Yale University and the GSAAP uh, at Columbia University, uh, which has strengthened her expertise in rapid urbanization and climate change-related development issues. She is currently the professor at Potsdam School of Architecture in Germany and the head of urban design in Oroville as well. She has been the recipient of the 2021 Reba Charles Jenks Award for her contribution to architectural theory, the 2021 August Perret Prize for Architectural Technology, and the 21 Building Sense Now Global Award for the German Sustainable Building Council. Her body of works was exhibited as a solo show called Taking Time at the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art in Denmark in 2020, but before that, her wall house one-to-one -one was a part of the Venice Biennale in 2012. A proud moment for us all. Uh, with studios based in Berlin, and in, in Berlin and in Pondicherry, Anupama's rigorous research and experiment experimentation in new materiality for architecture is the result of questioning basic assumptions and construction habits that humanity has adopted during the long process of industrialization. Rather than focusing on shortage, she sought abundance through investing in human resources and human resourcefulness, such as ingenuity, time, skills, care, and the sense of community. The act of building produces knowledge, just as the resulting knowledge produces buildings. I'm not going to say much more, but I'm going to invite Anupama to take the stage. Thank you so much for being here today. Anupama Kundu. Hi, good morning everyone. So lovely to be in Bombay. Uh, every time I come here, I am really impressed with uh, how people in the rest of the world are oblivious of our day-to-day -day problems and of uh, how many humans are populating the world and how solutions that we are proposing are often um, very elitist in the sense that if every, you know, sitting with one foot in Germany and looking at all of our problems from there, you know, one always wonders how, if the consumption pattern, the, the reduced green consumption pattern that is being promoted, um, let's say, in the green rating systems, in developed countries, if that were to be applied to India, China, or basically everywhere else, then how many planets would be required, um, and so on. I myself uh, came, because I found it a real blessing, having grown up in Bombay, I can never forget, uh, you know, the value of human resourcefulness in all the crowds, in all the shortage of resources we feel. Most of all, people who are here, they are quite focused on getting things done, developing themselves, and, uh, you know, um, not, uh, I would say, um, the way, it, I mean, Bombay has been a very big part of 
who I became. And I do want to share this perspective with you of my journey of um, over three decades since I graduated from um, JJ as an architect. And my journey took me to so many places and there were so many doubts, so many aspirations on the way. I'm uh, really happy to share with you how Bombay continues to inspire me and whatever I design and propose, I, however beautiful it looks or however sustainable it sounds, I wonder if it works if I were to apply any of those strategies in Bombay. And that's how I have continued to develop my um, architecture theories and also my building technologies. Um, I would like to explain that we all know that over the last um, decade, uh, sustainability is a buzzword, everybody is aware of it, but, um, or at least has, have started talking about it, or at least have acknowledged that current ways of doing a lot of things are unsustainable, even if we don't know what indeed is sustainable. But at a time where all these words were not there, that was in 1989 when I graduated in Bombay, I already uh, felt that human society deserves better. One didn't know as a young graduate where to um, you know, begin and um, not to just join offices and just have a job, you know, just to uh, become maybe even a wage slave and be, you know, just be doing something that everybody does and keep complaining about it. And you know, uh, then there's this idealism you have as a student. So for me, it was a very simple approach to, to pursue, uh, on one hand, that what one was really aspiring to do with all the education and idealistic education that one has as an architect, and being optimistic as an architect to want to always create something better, no matter how bad the problem looks, to still find a solution that looks humane, that looks uh, like forward thinking and so on. So with those kind of thoughts uh, on one hand, and on the other hand, having said, today I can say that my career was also developed by the fact that I said no to a lot of things. And those little, little moments when you're very tempted to do something, but you know it's not going to be necessarily a good thing for the long run or for yourself. And to, I think today I would say I'm very much shaped by all the little things I said no to and also a lot of big things. And uh, I learned how to say no and to wait. And you, to value yourself, your ideas, your time, your energy, and wait one more day, one more week, one more month to put that, your resources in the right place, in the right vision. So through that, I want to talk about my, basically I'm going to just share with you my journey. There are no perfect solutions. I'm just going to show some of the things I have been exploring and with all their questions, but one of the things that I felt more and more empowered to do with every passing, with every successive project is to, I felt more empowered to ask and question basic assumptions that are in society and we keep repeating you know, certain difficulties and many of them are myths and many other things we rely on are actually maybe to be questioned. So I started making a distinction between the universal laws and the man-made laws and try to surrender to the universal laws and question each and every man-made law because in the course of evolution, we have to keep reinventing new policies, new laws, and so on, and not to become a victim of all of that, especially in the age of industrialization and post-industrialization. So through those thoughts, I want to talk about sustainability, not from that various uh, checklists and numbers and figures and everybody doing the math, overly measuring what is easy to measure, and altogether leaving out the more important things which are harder to measure. Like we are, uh, and I'm very, very worried about sustainability becoming a list of boxes to check, where in the, on the paper it all sounds good and you get all kinds of certificates, but when you go there with your common sense, you don't feel good. So 
how does one navigate all that? So I want to put the focus on not the, only the depleting natural resources, which, by the way, are only depleting because of the way human resources are interacting with those resources. Over, you know, centuries, humanity and all other species have existed with the Earth as their habitat, and suddenly we are feeling that resources are depleting as if they are on their own depleting. It is only if whatever is depleting, it's because how humans have chosen to interact with each and every resource and how after post-industrial habits of mainstream standardization, etc., how we assume that what we need is exactly what we need and we don't, or in the way we waste a lot of things, you know, so now that, you know, that there's often a feeling that if you are going to be sustainable, you have to downscale your lifestyle or whatever, but actually a lot of it is what we are spending is not give, bringing us any good and we are wasting a lot of things because we are not being as ingenious as we've had to be when, let's say, we were poorer, where humanity wasn't taking refuge in all outer things to feel well, but they were focusing on how human beings themselves, with whatever was available, they kept crafting their life, and through that, the human being developed. I believe very much that what we make, makes us, and I'm also a believer in evolution, and I like to celebrate human resources, and my idea of sustainable living is about the human being progressing and continuing to produce at least a little better than their grandparents did and are not a lot worse. So I forgot to move the slides, but um, I just would like to begin with what we considered luxury in the past, let's say in India, or how in any ancient culture, the luxury of anything we produce, whether it's a sari or a biryani or a architecture, uh, it was, I think, it was not so much about the material being expensive or luxurious. It was more about take whatever's around you and if it's a simple dwelling, you do it basic. If it is something important, as a temple, you craft more and more. So what makes those temples and those architectures so stunning for us today, even today, it's a timeless beauty because it's the proportions, it's the aesthetics, it's a refined, cultivated mind, the cultivated hand, and that is something we can always forever enjoy. And I think this is this example of architecture, where you literally built with what is around you. It's not only with stone, where there was wood, you use wood in deserts, where there is no, there are no trees, you evolved human, humans through engineering and through, through their craft, they, understood how to build with literally anything. So if you have only earth, you develop domes and so on, and it kept, it, it related to your climate, it related to the culture that you created was shaped by the architecture and so on, and the knowledge to, to live and to eat well with what was around you, for me that is a luxurious thing because I think uh, it's taking whatever and making it so much value added because of the human uh, intervention. So human intervention for me is not at all a bad thing and I'm not ashamed of the human race. I'm just waiting for us to do way better with our actual uh, evolving capacities. Similarly, we, we have also built with ice when that's the, what you have. That's, that's architecture all over the world. And in a landscape where, you know, where the birds and the bees and all other animals, I mean literally now birds and the bees, that they all build their habitats, spiders, everybody, they, you don't need any courses to, you know, to have to build and, you know, it's inherent. So we, when we, the problem is one hand colonization, on the other hand, uh, uh, mainstream industrialization in certain places which have over standardized the production of anything in those places, not in our place, mass production, of things because those countries were mainstream industrialized and how could they, industrialization was very expensive, why did they manage to do that? 
because they were taking resources from other countries which they colonized. If people were to truly build with what you have around them, it's, we see what it is, you know, what it really costs. And you see that's why in a country like India where all the layers exist, you see what a low-end, low-tech thing costs and where a, a high-energy uh, industrial standardized product, what it costs and, with, and whom the money goes to and what pollution, what other impact it leaves behind. So, I think, um, for example, the standard house, which it is being provided all over the world, which is the same now nowadays, all the rich diversity of expressions from food to architecture to clothes, when it's being globalized, and by the way, only available in S, M, and L, People are growing up in, in our country is not so bad, but people who've gone through two, three generations with the SML, they feel something is wrong with their body when it, one of the three are not fitting. They don't think that somebody oversimplified the standardization. They don't think that there should be SML in different areas of your body. Somebody made this over standard thing, which leads to a lot of waste too. You have you have a lot of industrial waste in the, you know, now they're calling it circular economy. Instead of saying we are promoting linear economy, people are not yet owning up that some of those standard products that are being, the, which are the basis of architecture production in the developed countries, they are indeed producing a lot of waste because if you don't buy a one meter plank, you have to buy a two meter plank. We at least had the feet and inches variation. So there's a whole lot of wastage that is coming up about through the over-standardization, through the fact that those materials are not timeless, that they, uh, there is a changing fashion. All of those things are also part of the sustainability discussion as far as I'm concerned. What happens when all that lands in our context? We feel that the standard house what it is it's not so much a problem i think yet here but that kind of apartment which is designed for anybody to occupy always uh, the bhk approach you know like instead of talking about habitat we are talking about bhk you know so i had done a housing studio called beyond bhk because it's really I didn't know at one point what BHK was and then I you know, realized to what extent everything got converted. Even many people in other countries too, it's the BHK which is not being called that way. But a lot of housing uh, does not actually fit the clientele. As in many people are not the typical married couple with their uh, matrimonial bedroom and the children bedroom and master you know it's not like that and we we have everything has become so standardized that you are equally oppressed if you live in the over uh, you know if you're in the developer driven uh, kind of thing uh, or in the areas which are um, you know uh, are not able to afford the standard is so high even I've seen in the West everywhere now not only developing countries, from Copenhagen to London, every country, Berlin, they're talking about a housing crisis, affordability crisis, everything. Basically what the man-made production of housing is are unaffordable. And the, every progressive year, a larger chunk of your salary is going into housing. So this is a result of all what we have created and whether social, economic or environmental crisis it's good to acknowledge that it's actually pro created by architecture or the architectural and construction habits of the post-industrial world of ordering everything from catalogs and you know, not knowing where what comes from and so on. So for me, when I began my practice, I had been noticing um, it, uh, that all our rich building cultures in different country, different parts of India were being all replaced by the new vernacular material which was concrete and even that bricks were not being allowed to carry weight in our, in our country it's still not uh, something we say is out of the codes but in many countries like in Australia they say they call it brick veneer 
brick is just used to fill in. Actually, in the past, huge uh, famous architecture from Notre Dame to Hagia Sophia were all built in marvelous things with what Guastavino, load-bearing things. And now we are saying, no, it's, it's a seismic zone, so you cannot do all that. And we are, we are making everything concrete, the vernacular material. So through those, um, you know, through this over, this kind of chasing for efficiency, I began asking myself, what is the point of doing efficiently things that need not be done at all? So I started questioning how we are looking at efficiency and why we are going for the industrial, why are we in our context in India preferring it so much? In areas like Bombay, of course, we have to go vertical. There are very different problems. But should every park bench be now, like in Switzerland, designed in concrete because of our habits that are kicking in? So through these kind of concerns, I began to look at the opportunity of engaging human resources instead of thinking that the Western notion that time is money, why they don't involve people, they say, always say, oh, if you use the human person, it's going to be so costly. So we are trying to use machines to not allow humans to work. One thing is a washing machine and monotonous tasks, which we all don't want to do. No point uh, using our skills for that. But should, what is the cost of saving all that time is what I have been asking the last three decades. At what cost have we saved the time? What is the cost if the human being is not engaged? Like if, you, if I get a coffee in Berlin from a regular cafe, cafe downstairs where they know me and they know what, how to add the milk or whatever, it will cost about a euro or a bit more all over Italy, Spain. But the moment I go to Starbucks, the same guy is employed there, and I, neither that person or nor me, we can directly engage. See, it's a very dangerous thing when human is not allowed to engage. I'm not promoting that we go and do all the physical work. I'm saying that that goes, that the idea of disengaging the human and not allowing the human participation at all is very expensive. So problems don't get solved in the cafe as before. Everybody gives up on what kind of coffee they wanted to have because Starbucks will only give you that. And the person who is a very knowledgeable person who has been employed is not earning much more. The coffee costs five euros. We are not getting what we want. They are not getting, you know, we are all having to have the same exact coffee worldwide. So these are questions. It's a kind of Starbucksification also of architecture. If you are just taking ready-made elements and we have no more choice, and I think in India, we all, our crafts are too widespread. Our saris have not gone out of fashion or neither our khichdi and everything we eat. We have a really good um, kind of situation where we have not forgotten. So we should, I hope that, uh, you know, that this, we will be able to strike that good negotiation between handmade, machine-made, um, high-tech, low-tech, and so on, and navigate a better future for humans where the society and the built environment we create is one where we feel alive and we progress and we don't do monotonous, repetitive jobs, but we do remain ingenious. So I want to talk about time as a resource. When they talked about, uh, in the introduction, the Charles Jenks, uh, the Reba Award that I received for architectural theory, it was about time not only about space, as architects, looking at the time uh, value of things and how time plays out in past, present, and future visions, because humans are going to, architecture will outlive human life. And, you know, looking at the larger time implications, but also the daily implication of whether we, or not we can afford or to engage humans, or are we prioritizing that? So. So I just want to share now with images that when I left Bombay and I moved to Auroville, and I was actually basically not sure that I will live there, but I started exploring with my motorbike. I would go into the understanding. You know, we had, we had people like Laurie Baker and others at that time, you know, and development alternatives in Delhi. There was such a big, like there was a lot of people who were 
contributing to the materiality explorations and so on. And it helped, it had the, those things had opened my mind and I felt that somewhere there are clues in the sourcing of material. So I used to go to the sources and figure out how kilns, how brick kilns in India, uh, uh, you know, after the Louis Kahn buildings, a lot of us, we were taught in our school that, you know, the wire cut brick and its superior properties as opposed to the kacha brick. And when I started going around, I realized that the so-called kacha brick with its imperfections are so because they are radically cheaper. They cast them on fields. That's why they are not smooth, not on the table. They make a brick stack and fire it with thinnings of the forest that they themselves are growing. And so it's, it's a, the whole territorial engagement of a lot of people and community in producing bricks in the way they are produced. And the fact that the lime also being produced in small kilns like that. And the, when you finish baking your bricks, again, it's a field. So in the monsoon time, whatever clay collects, you, brick, you make bricks out of it. And I started realizing that the so-called bad brick is perhaps a good brick and the other way around. And I thought, how can I produce architecture where the imperfections are designed in because I realize that actually good enough is perfect and go beyond that perfection that is the result of not human humane or the human hand but the result of certain machines which once you let them go you can't tweak them then you have to produce absolute mass production in that kind of way a lot of these kind of kiln culture is actually, we are losing out, but the way of producing bricks in India is the exact same one as the Mohenjo-daro people did. The outer bricks, the kilns are like a Jenga kind of brick stack, and the outer bricks, they are fired less because they are, the wall is colder, and when those cheaper bricks are classified as class three, and you can use them in the interiors or places where you don't need strength. And I had to go, I'm sorry I'm taking so much time in this uh, thing rather than showing the architecture because I want to share with you, I've been discussing with people here, you know, the, the cement carbon st uh, stand there and we've spent years finding out one or the other thing and I'm concerned if we, like Ray Meeker, whom I'll talk about in a bit, he spent 20 years firing earth houses, all this knowledge is going to go but the knowledge is not in the flashy brochures, it's only in our minds. How does one sh share this, you know, and that people don't have to start from scratch to find out those kind of things. But these bricks are, are uh, quite intelligent, in my opinion now, what I think about it. And also, even if we industrialize and we give up all our lime culture to, um, to Portland cement, because we uh, university educated people know how to use Portland cement, but to use lime or local clay, we'll have to know a lot more. So I feel what they call low tech is actually high tech. To build a vault or to, your calculations are not so easy. So the craftsman knows a lot of things and it's not just that he's being used. Like today, we draw something and we just use the craftsman to just draw exactly what we know and if they don't agree with us, instead of seeing where we missed out, we tend to dominate them and say this is the design and that is the thing and then when there is an imperfection we say it was a bad workmanship. But it's actually a much bigger plot behind it of collaboration. So when I started using natural materials, in, even in India most people say that so if I try to literally use the stone from the site, people tend to say that it's going to be very expensive. Also, we have seen, but I would like to tell all the young people here, many times these are myths. If you do the math, you will find out in which moment it is more expensive and in which case it is not. Let's not just repeat this, these discouraging words and tell everybody, if you, do, if you involve a very custom-made thing, it's very expensive. It's not. Sometimes custom-made is much cheaper. Just because one guy is going to require a certain table, why should the whole world use it? Why? That, that is the problem. Architecture, how much ever you standardize the elements, every plot is different and every architecture is custom made. So let's not feel guilty when we custom make. Let's celebrate that we do. When uh, wedding dress is custom made, when uh, uh, 
you know, meal is custom made or a cake is custom. You can have a factory made cake and yet know how to make a cake and sometimes make a birthday cake yourself. Or if someone has an allergy, leave out that thing. Custom made doesn't, allows you to adapt. And it makes us also enjoy, you know. So I think in India we should really not adopt those kind of myths which are coming from other contexts. In fact, we should teach them what is the cost of not engaging our human intelligent preference and intuition. So I, in those early years, I had seen that in a small area like Tamil Nadu, there were all these buildings and things are used. If I go into how stones are quarried, the machine quarries, how they look, the hand, you see the scale of a hand made thing, where with, with, with that kind of intelligence, even the way these slabs, the granite slabs, how they are extracted, just slim, non-muscular people are handling huge slabs of stone. It's just good to know, you know, it's good to know what really goes on in the country and what happens where materials are sourced. And I think that's where the problem lies. Um, and I try to produce architecture with sourcing things and always prioritizing human engagement because before I had done all the calculations and got, been in academic environment, I had a feeling that that uh, it has to, I mean, it's better whatever your budget is, there's still a component that goes into material and to another that goes into labor. And I had a simple formula that if I'm going to spend more of my budget on human labor, which everybody was trying to reduce, I felt that I will be sustainable because the money is going to remain in the local economy. So I used to try and I found if you use local material, it's even more cheap. So I would just try to spend much more on making contemporary solutions, but the materiality was local. And local didn't mean just repeating vernacular things, but finding out what problems, which communities, which skills are available. And I found that was my easy answer to uh, ec uh, economic strategies. Whatever there is a lot of, use it. If there's a lo lot of things lying around, find a way to use it. Our ancestors have done it. If there's a lot of clay, use the clay. If there's, if there's a lot of people without jobs, use the labor. If whatever there is a lot of, use it. And when it comes to labor or, or local capacities, that's the only place where you don't have to reduce yourself to what is available. That's where you have to upgrade. You can bring in skills. So in the beginning, you know, Rajendra Desai and uh, Rupal had done uh, you know, and, and you know, there were, you know, in Valod there was these uh, experiments and I was always in, uh, inspired by what other people were doing at that time when I was still in school. And some of those things later, I, because I was uh, close to a potter's com community, I, and I had always uh, a feeling that through engineering, you can continue in the future to use significantly less resources than your forefathers. That's my measure. Like, can you build more square meters, cubic meters, with the same materials? That is already going to work out to be advantageous. So I used some of the engineering uh, to be able to produce. Um, so, so for example, um, you know, the, the, the Mangalore tiles, the terracotta tiles that you see all over the south, and also, uh, I thought, actually everywhere, they require a lot of wood and substructure and so on. So I found that these kind of systems have a lot of advantages and there were a lot of potters trying to sell their pots which nobody is going to buy because there's clay around. So I tried to see how can I divert that, that what the urbanization is threatening, the livelihood of those artisans or, or potters, how could we permanently secure them because there's going to be a whole city coming up here and if we could create some building technology palette with which we could build. So I started experimenting and quite radical experimentation also to some extent. So this is of my wall house where uh, it became very known. Eventually Apple TV made a whole episode on it uh, when they launched uh, Apple TV on a, on a uh, the first season of Home. 
uh, those who want, they could see, and it's a lot about Bombay and how that led to the kind of work I did and so on. Anyway, so these are all from almost 25, 30 years ago. This, this is a recent photograph though. And in this, what I started doing is, this is me just out of college. Just to tell all the students, okay, don't let what you do not know interfere with what you do know. That's very important because we shouldn't be insecure with the uncertainty of what we don't know. That what you don't know, if you know what you don't know, you can find it out. Okay? So I, I started working with local potters. I had met Ray Meeker, who was a, is a very famous ceramist based in Pondicherry. And um, I got them to make the same brick studies that I did to make them make that locally, not in a factory. And first with potters, later when there was more demand, not to throw these in a wheel, but just that any unskilled labor can be able to do. So we made extruders and we started, you know, all th with, with the help of many others. That's why I, I strongly believe in collaboration because I knew whatever you don't know, there are people out there who know that. So work with them. And so we produced, see how it's being fired with just coconut shells and so on, very high quality compared to many other Gurna tiles that I had seen up to then because I had Ray Meeker's expertise. And we were figuring, figuring out with the craftsmen in the early years how to really apply all that. If you notice the bricks, these are the kacha bricks with which I then uh, found uh, it, they, they even look regular, but because of the optical illusion that you create with the pattern and the joint and the lime mortar, the lime mortar takes forever to set. So we put a little bit of cement, 5%, so we can see how can you find these hybrids instead of polarizing traditional ways and modern future ways. So this house uh, is somehow the representation of a lot of things. Um, and it was, became like my laboratory because of seven types of roofing systems inside that. And I tested all I needed to be able to apply them to actually other projects. By then I had a lot of projects. I was building a lot of buildings. It was at the peak of my office there when I um, was building this house. But this is an example of the Pongal cooking pot that Normally, you get in Tamil Nadu, and of course, people are no longer using it except on Pongal. So, I found a way the more I, you know, the more I worked with the community, the more ideas I got. And I, that's why I believe that you build, you can, I believe in building knowledge and building community while building buildings. So, that's what leads to the next thing. And I found a way to use these pots to use them as lost form work for casting efficient concrete slabs which did not need insulation. The other ones are insulating. And I used to live there without fans uh, in the humid weather. And this is a proof of how, how you know, ventilation is, is still a thing to be looked at. So here you notice that there are only three, uh, there are only, there's only one bar of steel per every typically three because of the, the filler slab. You know, uh, again, Laurie Baker was doing filler slabs and I, I was thinking, if you could de deepen the module, then you would make your slab even thinner and less concrete, less steel, significantly less steel. Many years later, IIT professors helped us to calculate. So this again, are things that I tested in the wall house, but I was doing it for 13 meter, 15 meter spans of projects I had for workshop, workshop spaces and so on. And so in this house, it was a medley of all kinds of things. You see a, you see a wooden table there, which is uh, made with two piece logs of rosewood with carpentry joints. It is a test for something. The, uh, you know, the swing and the handrail are made out of recycling old wood with the craftsman's work. So it, I was, trying to protect the house from looking like a, you know, complete uh, medley of all the lab things to be tested. But still, there was a unity through the local material. Also, we produced uh, extruded, slightly trapezoidal shaped things to produce, produce with minimum steel, flat slabs where you can need to use the roof and you can't use a bolt. So, a lot of things in that house, which many people don't know, are actually prototypes for other larger projects that I had. And 
this is uh, the result of that. Ferro cement is being tested only one inch thick uh, material because you know uh, we'll come to ferro cement in a bit. But anyway, so this is this is the house where I live when I'm in Oroville. But ten years before I lived in that house, I actually stayed in a hut like this. So you know, so. The first 10 years when I went, I, I was staying very basic. Uh, I think my bike had costed more than the house. The bike plus solar panel, they were the most costly things in this house. I remember I paid this house, by the way, for those who know how cheap it was to build with thatch and all at that time. The house, the upper floor, it was on stilts. I had not afforded the lower floor. I thought better go up, less snakes, which was not true. but. Uh, that upper thing cost was paid with one article I wrote for Indian architect and builder because I left Bombay with 500 rupees basically just wanting to be an architect and not to you know just just to hold out and do the right thing but that's how cheap it was at that time if you were ready to live like this but while living like this I thought at that time I thought coming from Bombay one year one year only it'll last or something, but I thought one year is a long time because I was young and I thought one year was a whole eternity to not be doing the wrong job. But in fact, I stayed here for 10 years and it, was, it could stay longer. And I realized when I talk about time in architecture, what, what I realized is in this, our traditional architecture, the thatch has to be replaced every three years. If you didn't replace your thatch, then the wood below will get ro rotten, which every 10 years you should check. Uh, the floor below the bamboo mat, there is a kind of palm with which you can make fantastic floors. The coconut rope that ties it together, you may, again, you might have to replace some of them. So they, they age differently, like our body's organism, the skin cells come off at a certain point, the liver has its own cycle. So actually buildings also don't age like, like modern buildings. One thing, the frame doesn't work, so the whole building has to be taken down. So these things could live forever. You constantly replace. And in this very simple life that I had, I realized if you were ready to live like this, you could liberate your time. If you liberate your time, then you have time to think. You have time to think before you act. And then you actually have a peaceful life. And you have a long life because each day feels like a long day. And then I realized time is my main resource and I'm not going to put it at the service I, of just anything. And why are humans in society not valuing their time as a resource? So that's why my thesis, which later developed about around time as the most important human resource, to please use, use it for, a good, for good things. So I think I maybe should just show some images without comments uh, because I, I'm no, there is still time actually. Um, so then from the first decade of projects which were about single houses, of humble dwellings, but a lot of material research. Whenever I had time and there were no clients, I always took the time to develop things, solutions for problems that I detected. And I didn't feel that anxiety that I don't have a client. I know a lot of people are very worried about how to get a client. And I think that was my blessing when I, in retrospect, that when the clients weren't there, I had my lined up things which I'm going to work on. And every year, even now, I try to do one thing which is not client driven, uh, just nothing against clients, but to just know what are your own questions and to try to answer them. So. Here, I by then realized the value of time and I, in the housing projects, um, we, the first larger housing scheme in Auroville that I did, it was a prototype for an urban eco community. And I, I wanted to, I was very inspired by the Danish co-housing ideas. And I felt if people would share their chores and how much time would be liberated, particularly for the women whom I saw uh, enslaved by domestic duties and therefore, all the things they would have to go to were far away, so I thought it could be nice to uh, plan common, uh, you know, um, spaces like that. I would love to do a project like that in Bombay, in fact, because I think people in Bombay would really enjoy, uh, you know, uh, that type of community and things at your doorstep. So elderly could have shared common 
vehicles, young people don't mind taking them to the concerts in the evening, and so they all can help each other, kind of. So with that idea, we also explored if humans, the, the time that they could put into their own construction if they want to, if they, there is no other resource, and through only sweat equity as the only possibility. So I started uh, realizing that it's important not to uh, alienate, like not to have technologies which will alienate uh, all the common people. By the way, even normal local masons and all that often don't get, get to participate in big projects where companies from other places which have XYZ turnover have to be given those jobs. So all of those are actually contributing to other problems elsewhere that you don't see. So I try to find some tasks, like in this case, we had to do a wastewater treatment plant, so we took the earth out of, um, uh, you know, we had to dig a thing, and the earth was suitable for rammed earth, which is in this case stabilized with 5% of cement, so it didn't need overhangs to protect them. And um, we, although the apartments have different sizes and so on, there's a sense of harmony, and there, is a, there are streets on upper levels to connect this and to build the sense of community. And um, you know, if you notice, these walkways are detached from the facade so that the rain, there's a big rain protection, a huge cantilever roof, but the hot air can escape from over the windows. So it's all calculated for that climatic point of view and so on. But in terms of more radical experimentations, I got more and more encouraged every time we took risks and didn't fail. We got bolder and bolder and did, did, felt like having more fun and exploring more things. So this is uh, one area where, again, my relationship with Ray Mika, who is the ceramist I talked about, I used to follow the work of many other architects doing good work, and he was one of them. And he was, I was seeing through his work how to build with earth on one hand, but on the other hand, he was building large scale mud houses and firing them in situ. It was a bizarre idea and I just loved people who are even bolder and more courageous doing even more crazy sounding things, but doing it systematically like a scientist over 20 years. So at one point he said, I'm done with this, I'm not doing any more. At that time, Pratima Bedi had contacted him to do a Nityagram temple. And he said, Anu, uh, I don't know, I'm doing this last one. And I, I used to document his work and so on. Later I did my PhD on this. But, so I had gone there for supervising the site and, you know, learned so much is there to understand about brick kilns and all the other things I explored through his work. So, but just to summarize that, what really happens in this technique is that, as I told you, normal bricks, when they are cooked in a Hoffman kiln or any industrial process, about, oh no, I think I didn't tell it, sorry, I told it yesterday in our conversation. About 40% of the energy that you generate in an oven, 980 degrees, 40% of that gets absorbed by the kiln wall. Each firing, you're losing that much of fuel, I mean, energy. So Ray's idea was that if the house is a kiln and you pack your things inside, your products to be cooked, and the house could get cooked as a consequence, so he spent years investing how to insulate, because 40% is not enough maybe to fire the whole thickness. So the whole thing of became a structural thing and many houses that I had been documenting, that can be seen on my, in my PhD online, but basically, I found this technique fascinating. And I feel even if there is a 5% chance to succeed, meanwhile, I was not expecting a 50% chance of succeeding. Even if there is 5-10%, I think it's a big thing to explore because we need radical ideas and we need laboratory uh, kind of environment. So, and I was very afraid if he stops, that knowledge will be gone. So, in that way, I'm kind of really concerned about other knowledges all of us here have, which we are somehow not sharing because they don't fall un under any easy framework. But there's a lot of decentralized knowledge and intelligence in us, and we really, it will go with us. So it's important. And so after the PhD, I decided to do one more, 
I had done two or three buildings in this technique and he passed on some of the clients to me saying I'm done with this, I'm a ceramist, I, I solved, I know what I know. If anybody's interested, they have to take it up. But he was ready to help. So what it involves is you build a mud house with mud bricks and mud mortar. So you see that for me what was the interesting thing is you don't even need cement. And by the way, I'm a big lover of cement also. So I just like to use it judiciously when you need to make a bridge and uh, to use radically less of it or when it has to give some waterproofing, uh, etc. So here, you see there are some holes down there for the oxygen to come in. It has to be designed like a grill and an oven and some fireboxes. And all the bricks you're planning to bake in it are stacked on top of it. In this case, we had gone even further. We took the coal dust from factories sweeping the floor. They have calorific value and we mixed 5% of that in the brick. And then the, you only have to light the fire and later it bakes from its own waste fuel. So when the bricks are cooked for three, four days, the whole place is on fire. And uh, it's a very fantastic thing. It's like when you're sitting outside the oven and you're seeing the cake, where will it break, whatever. It's that kind of thing. And then it really glows, the structure, and it's a magical process of vitrification where the earth is going to become waterproof. And fire is the cement. It will melt all those bricks and fuse them. So I did all this. At that time, I had already be, be, I'd gone to, to Berlin, I think, by then. And some of this, we produced our own bricks. I put our logo because, you know, RA with Ray and my initials, because all the brick wallas, they always have a stamp of their initials. So I said, okay, let's put it, because you have to have the stamp too for the next layer to stick. The bricks that are produced here, inside can be any size, because you're producing decentralized. You, the house is no longer a consumer, but a producer of building materials locally. You can fi fire any ceramic thing inside it. And the advantage is, see, you see the wall behind the you can see how the fire moved some places are overcooked some not like the brickwork where it's pixelated because they all bricks don't fire uniform even in factories and then they have that character but here it has a different character and um, and in Ray's work and by the way he didn't just do a simple house I'm showing you that dome but he's done also complex things over 20 years bigger housing schemes but he also fired, see, so much ceramic, wash basins, toilet pans, water spouts, glaze tiles, whatever can be cooked al along with it. And in our case, it was a ho homes for homeless children. So we used uh, waste materials to also complete the project with whatever they had. It was like a zero money. It was built out of the knowledge. We were seeking knowledge and we could do this. Um, so wait, before I come to the ferrocement, the one thing I want to say about this technique is that it's, it's very interesting that to use fire is actually a household thing. Every house has fire for cooking. And if we were, I was investigating in the PhD, what happens to the socioeconomic impact if the fire is brought to the building site instead of all the bricks being taken to a factory at that scale of production? And if local people who are everywhere making bricks with the, wherever the clay collects, if they can make housing out of it, and so on. So this technique is still in its infancy, but I mean, there's so many more. And the whole, uh, the three broad brackets of research, I would say, for everybody here, uh, they are, many of you are already doing it, is how could, what can be further optimized in the uh, vernacular architecture? Like what our grandparents did, they were also evolving. There's no particular year before which it was traditional and then it's modern. So how could we continue to optimize a lot of things which still work? Second is, like the pottery thing, how could you use age-old materials in new ways? How could you have radically new ways to use timeless material and use far less of it? The third group is modern new materials and how to use them very judiciously. We have to navigate climate change. We need our plastic for COVID. We need our, uh, let's not become fanatic. We need research in concrete. We need a lot of research exactly in the high embodied energy materials. That's why I really appreciated the carbon um, tiles and that kind of thing. We really have to do that. And um, 
in that, in that spirit, I'm exploring also ferro-cement since many, many years. So ferro-cement, instead of concrete, I showed you those screens. It's one inch thick. It's the thickness. If you do a brick work, many people accuse me now uh, of uh, being a sustainability person. Why are you using cement? So I tell them, you only call me sustainable. And now you are disappointed, but please don't put us in boxes. In a brick, normal brick work, you have two plaster thicknesses inside and outside. Take one of them, and that's ferro cement. And you don't even use the brick, you don't even use all of it. It's so thin, if you find out how to use engineering to bend and use very thin material, if you can, the strength comes from how you shape it, how you fold it, bend it, and make it rigid. Like, you know, the normal paper, if you fold it, as children know, if you fold it zigzag as a fan, it's going to become rigid and it won't fall because of its strength. So here I'm exploring actually how form gives strength. As an architect, it's like a very exciting area to work with, playful also. So instead of using thick bars of steel, we use very thin chicken mesh. So that is again a household thing. Every farm needs a chicken mesh you get in all the remote areas. It's not large diameter bars, and you can cut it with pliers, and anyone can basically do it. So I'm doing a whole lot of research here. This was exhibited in the Venice Biennale, all my ferro-cement research. Even I'm looking into natural fibers, if there is possibility. That, that I can't do alone, but I was, I was fortunate enough to collaborate with Mike Schleich, uh, German uh, Schleich Bergermann, and partner engineers who actually do bridges. This is the problem. The knowledge we need in all this has to come from people who do very high-tech bridges and so on, to, because they have to make things light. And it's very embarrassing to go to them and say, can you guide me on a three-meter span housing roof? So when you have an exhibition like Venice, you can actually go to them and say, uh, you know, can we collaborate and push the boundaries with something? So that, like that, we have managed to push some of these boundaries. And also, you know, here there's also glass fiber in the middle there, non-rust elements, which are also energy-wise interesting. But what I did with it, two types of housing. Um, one of them, see, when I say taking time, it doesn't mean that the architecture has to be only, or when we talk about slow architecture, it's not the, it's the thinking which is slow, taking the time to think. But when you actually apply like this, you can build the, housing in a week, like this one. These are like a Lego type system uh, where the modules are made to accommodate for very low cost housing or farmhouses or wherever people want to put up the house in a week, you know? And these are ferro cement. The surfaces are like stucco and like, you know, IPS kind of finishes, waxed with color pigments embedded. But there are 60 centimeter, like two feet modules and one foot modules for putting your different objects, including kitchen sinks. I don't know if I already showed it. No, I don't have a picture. But some of these elements, this could be used for an office. The thing about it is that I'm trying to produce them through my knowledge of bricks and pots, which I showed. I designed the social sustainability strategy for this to be produced in the backyards of Mason's home. So any Saturday, Sunday, if they need to produce one or the other, teach the children how to craft it. It's a very household, it's like knitting. You can, little bit more, I mean, you could, you could make it at home. You can make it anywhere. It doesn't involve much infrastructure. It's easy to handle. So this was exhibited in the 2016 Venice Biennale as a full-scale prototype, where you see one kitchen sink also, it is already everything planned and it's in it. And in this case, of course, some are actual ferro cement and some others were all recycled from the previous Biennale's cement boards. So, um, so yeah. And uh, next to that housing unit, there is a toilet unit which they are currently exhibiting in the Delhi Biennale right now. Um, uh, it's called EZWC. I had seen one ad in which Amitabh Bachchan, uh, I don't remember the details, was trying to talk about um, sanitation and how people have cell phones and for that 
cost. I mean, actually, I thought, well, if everybody has that, but in many areas, no sanitation. And toilets have such an ugly association. Then I found out, I had a lot of arguments also with architects in the fraternity who told me this won't work because, uh, you know, public toilets in this sector, nobody can afford. And I was saying, I don't agree with undignified use of promoting public toilets. Even in Venice Biennale, the public toilet is very bad. It's the problem with the public toilet. Every, everybody needs a dignified private toilet. And if we can make it easy to plug in to various situations, uh, you could either plug the base. There are three different base plates, but it's just one light ferro cement unit. You have four pieces. You come and put it up in a few hours. The base plate could be a dry sanitation or plug into like a cell phone. You need, a, you need to either connect to the infrastructure or not. And so, or you need to, you know, either make um, uh, your, um, in, like, a decentralized septic tank or a dry thing, which you can do. But the upper units, they can do it modular. You can just buy the bottom plate, and you could even have cloth curtains initially, but the sanitation is first. Then comes the walls, when you can afford it, then the roof. But actually, the whole thing is quite affordable. You can see it can be produced very easily. And these are some German tests we did to show, to test for the Biennale how, instead of breaking, it bends. If you, and we broke, we, uh, we hammered down concrete and ferrocement next to it to see how this is indeed stronger. Okay, now I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to um, show how I'm also using for non-prefabricated applications, I'm trying to use crease patterns from origami, etc., that can allow us to build, this is just one is to two scale, but apply ferro cement on the spot with forms, like this is designed after the tsunami for seismic and other disasters, that you can take these Amazon cartons, this was designed 10 years ago, but now we have more of this material. You can just put it up, very little chicken mesh, and you have a shelter. It takes four days to do. So a lot of my research is available that mostly is seen in exhibitions now. And I would, I still have 35 seconds, so I'm just going to mention one point um, and um, talk about work I'm doing with urban waste as well. These are sofas made out of magazine catalogs, as well as temporary pavilions, etc that I'm taking whatever we find from the garbage and extending their life. This was in Barcelona called Library of Lost Books. As well as using waste in building processes, not only in products, sometimes adjusting your door windows and not spending money in form work, using masonry, using broken chai cups, et cetera, and masonry, wherever something got manufactured. Architecture can permanently absorb all the junk or the waste, you know, and it, it, because we are interested in what the, occupying the part that we didn't build, the void. So that's another area of exploration. I'm, this was something about involving students with urban waste. But I'm just running through the slides. So if there's any discussions, this is wall house, again, built with students at Venice in David Chipperfield's 2012 invitation. And I'll end with this, uh, since uh, I'm, uh, many people know about my involvement in Auroville. I'm writing this book at the moment, about to come out, where I had the opportunity for 17 years to work alongside Roger Angers, who is the chief architect, late chief architect. This is his centenary year. I'm very happy to remember him and his adventurous spirit and all the guidelines he gave for urban design, uh, for future densities, and starting with new mobility. This is a car-free city planned in the 60s which finally it's going to perhaps see the light of day because uh, you know, there are more resources coming in to build Auroville. And in this, many of my projects that I showed are lying, uh, uh, you know, located. And I'm ending with this image that 
where we are taking uh, one of the many people don't know that actually Oroville was uh, planned with density, you know, and I was always attracted to this kind of development. And I'm looking at uh, right now uh, the, the open question of high rise will be required. And how can we humanize? How can we bring in the human scale? And one of the uh, Rogers had given us many strategies for that. I feel in places like Bombay, we can look at how we don't separate the tall skyscrapers from the rest of the urban fabric, use the roofs. And uh, here I'm with Jan Gale working on pedestrian mobility. How can we use the roofs for streets so that the ground floors uh, can directly open to the gardens? And uh, this is what I'm working on, one of the 8,000 people development in which we are trying to have intimate human scale even within high rise and to have lots of co-housing based small clusters of 40 to 60 people sharing facilities and looking at the materiality of the facades of the future where urban waste has a place, urban farming, through innovative integration of water and wastewater, automatically watering facades and vegetation, etc., and uh, and also uh, yeah, looking at how to manage a new face of a new architecture that is more thoughtfully and sensitively created, with hopefully collaboration instead of competition. Thank you. Anupama, if we can request you to stay. Oh, sure. If you'd be kind enough to take a few questions from the oh, audience. Please. That's sure. Or Anybody comments. questions? It's been an exhaustive uh, presentation. Exhaustive in the best way possible, of course. Exhausting. Uh, not exhausting, <laughs> maybe for you. But any questions from the audience? Yes, please. So, um, good morning. First of all, I'm Krisha, uh, a student from LTI days. So my question to you is, uh, since you said you left uh, Mumbai for having just 500 rupees, right? Uh, so what, uh, and went to Auroville. So what were your uh, challenges? What were your problems and struggles? And how did you solve it? Oh my God. <laughs> I can't even tell you how many challenges I had. But the blessing I also had was that I never focused on problems. That's all I can say. I always, ask myself and I still do I every day we have problems you know with on all levels from domestic to at practice and I always ask myself before I act I ask myself what would I do if I didn't have the problem so I try to come out of the problem in some space in me and ask myself what would what is the right thing that I should put my action in and uh, not let the problem or the fear advise me too loudly don't pay too much attention. So when I find out what would I do if I didn't have the problem, then I say, okay, let's do it anyway. Because then I realize that that problem is not going to make me question the goal where I was going. I'm, it's just a little hurdle on the way. It's going to delay the thing or something is, or maybe I don't get to do it, but why should I change my course because of the problem? Right. Thank you, thank you very much. If I may ask a follow-up question, you said that you occupy yourself with your own curiosities and frame your own questions when you don't have client work, or every year you try to take out the time to do non-client work. So what are your current curiosities right and now inquiries? I'm, right now, I am uh, very, very absorbed in how to build high-rise buildings, which are you know, uh, which have enough relief in that, in that, that the, uh, how to address the monotony of over repetition, mm. however a good thing, what, however well an apartment is designed or a facade, if you over repeat it, anything will be a disaster. And I'm, I think this is a, still an open question, but I have done a lot of work the last five years on it. That's one thing. The other thing I'm very interested in is in artificial intelligence mm. and to find out how to match up with the natural intelligence to cope with what is possible because I think the artificial intelligence with human stupidity will be a very dis big disaster. So I do feel excited about what is possible and I'm really trying to inform myself. I like to come out of my comfort zone mm -hmm. and find out where is a great opportunity. I usually, I'm not, just whenever I feel fear, I try to investigate more to know more about that thing and see how could we leverage it in a good way.
That's wonderful. Consciously. <laughs> Consciously. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Hello, ma'am. Uh, I'm Durva from same college, like LTIDS. Uh, so, like you said, you were uh, creating that roof with the help of those cups and potteries, right? Uh, I tried a similar project in my college. It was an installation, but to revamp or maybe redesign a corner of a college, like there was a window and it was a dead space uh, at the end of a passage. So I got inspired from your projects and oh, <laughs> that you. similarly I made a uh, partition wall out of colored cups which were found on the uh, uh, nearby uh, cafe, which was nearby from a college. So it was like we collected them before 24 hours, like if it was disposed from morning to the evening. So while going uh, home from the college, I collected them, I cleaned them up because they couldn't survive for more than 24 hours. They might get uh, infected and all. So I cleaned them up, I and my team. Uh, so, and after that, we created a weaving pattern of, uh, so it consisted of timber frame, the colored cups in a weaving pattern and uh, mesh. So, and we created a simple seating over there, uh, also of wood. Everything was reused and recycled. So it was our motto and we did a minimum, uh, a really minimum uh, expenditure, like everything was, and uh, that reminded, like the project you are showing, that reminded me of my project. So it's my start. Well done, show me the photos later. Yeah, 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 sure ma'am. And uh, like that's what, uh, uh, while doing that also, I had an artistic block or you can say a creative block. Like there was a point I was stuck. Oh, w what should I do? Where should I, like, so any uh, experience you had like that while doing such projects, like you had a block, you don't know how to go ahead, like, or... Yeah, I mean, it happens, but I am not very attached when I have a problem, when I, there is a block, I don't uh, worry about it. I feel it indicates, um, it indicates that we are not satisfied with the standard of what we've done, but it's good not to give up, but it's yes. good maybe take a break, do something else and then you will come back and also it's okay to drop a project. You still learn that it that was not a good idea and you can only find out when you uh, come to that roadblock and sometimes eight years later you will find a way how to use it. Yes, thank yeah. you so much. Okay, we might have time for one more question. Uh, hi ma'am. Uh, oh. I have yeah. a question. Um, so as a legendary architect, What's your next goal? What's my? What's your next goal to do for the community? My goal is to collaborate. Like collaborate with? Uh, with other people. Not to just be in my silo doing. It's not a goal really. But I've done a lot of things. And I feel, I always believe that this architecture, the competition culture we have is not the only way to produce excellence. I believe much more because my, uh, my work is a proof of that. And I, I think uh, I'm very happy to whatever knowledge I gained, that's why I went into academia to, to empower many other people, to encourage them because half the time uh, younger yeah. people are not doing things because there is intimidation, bullying, and there's a lot of things, yeah. you know, which we face when we are in our journey. So I try to make it a bit easier for yeah. others, but also, we can complement each other by, with the knowledges we have. I'm very excited and I really believe in the human potential. Uh, many times when people do very bad things, they say, you know, if somebody's cheated, they say, yeah, of course, human nature is like that, we are greedy. But how many people tell about good things yeah. about human nature? Actually, human nature is a very good thing. That's why I take some time in the morning to do nothing and to realize that actually it's a great potential to be born as a human and to be with other humans and there's a lot of goodwill around. I think uh, there's, uh, it's incredible what we will be able to do if we are ready to work with others. Like what change can you bring in the society? Like See, we are not so important, you know. I don't think we are that, I don't, I am at peace with my irrelevance since that's my blessing from growing up in yeah. Bombay. So you don't take yourself so seriously, but you know that there are things where you can be a good instrument to allow something. So I try to enable. Wherever I see something, I could enable. I get, get a great satisfaction from that. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. 
Anubama, the one thing that I'm, I'm left with, and I think this has resonated with a lot of people, is you said, don't let what you do not know interfere with what you do, and what you don't know, there are others to do that. Yeah. I think that's, that's a great sort of way to put it, because there are so many people, it's collaborative, and we all have our own little expertise, and we all know what we're doing, and we can all contribute to a process. But thank you so much for this beautiful presentation, for sharing your journey. Thank you so much. And I have to say, I really love the title. So that's why I came here with a little more time. Because I think really, and in fact, the whole project of Auroville, it's not about just how it was originally envisioned is the consciousness. We are all doing our inner work. Absolutely. But to do collective, you know, the collective consciousness's power has not even begun to be explored, I feel. So I hope I get to see that in my lifetime we'll with all of you. Scratch Thank the you. surface of it slowly. Thank you.